Okay, we can begin. So, steering clutch time on 11.13. I want to attach these levers to something. So, we can put a whole bunch of pieces into the back area of this case right here. You can see I've already invested some time into cleaning and prepping the already loose components. These weren't anything that were disassembled off camera. This is all stuff that was taken apart during the teardown phase. So, you can see I have two batches. They are separated left side here as the case sets and then right side components right here so i like to keep all that stuff matched because you do have wear patterns from pieces that have contacted and what have you so yeah just uh pretty much you know quick break down the uh, steering clutch actuator levers and then you have the shaft and the bearings for those pull rod return spring washer acorn nut hold down bolt, bolt, sorry, steering clutch to bevel gear shaft. We have like oil supply tube stuff. Made sure that stuff was all open. Supply tube bracket, the yoke, and again, made sure the passages were open and clean on these bolts that attach the yoke to the release bearing housings. Banjo bolts, again, passages clean. Brass catch cups, classy, what can I say? Just love that kind of stuff, so. And then pinch bolt and adjuster bolt right there. And over here, what is going to be our teardown bench, we have both of the steering clutch packs. So we do need to assess these somewhat before we go ahead and take them apart. The release bearings honestly are a lot better than what you usually find. I do have brand new ones that are gonna go in, but I uh, certainly don't think I'm gonna be getting rid of those. And we also want to measure clutch pack thickness on both of these. So that can give us a pretty good idea what condition is like before we even take them apart because we do have thickness specs for those, new spec, minimum spec, all that. That stuff's not that easy to find. Pretty much the only place I've ever really found it is in this selected articles from service magazines book. This thing is just awesome. There's so much good stuff in here, at least for the D2. None of the information you're gonna see right here is in the service manual either. I don't know why, but they have an interesting topic though titled steering clutch wear. Nice little diagram with a full breakdown. Lots of different models, lots of different specs. So basically, well, we'll just read it. The question is often asked, how much wear can take place in the steering clutches in various models of Caterpillar tractors before the face of the inner drum or C will bottom at A right there on the pressure plate. In other words, the clutch pack up here gets so thin that those two pieces start contacting and the springs can no longer exert pressure on the pack. That's your maximum permissible wear, I would guess. So in the chart, the first column gives the dimension B, right up here, or distance between the pressure faces of the inner drum and the pressure plate when the clutch has been assembled with all new plates. This figure is an average and individual clutches may measure slightly more or less as a result of manufacturing tolerances. The second column gives the dimension B when wear has progressed to the point that surfaces A and C touch. So we go to the chart and we have assembled thickness of steering clutch plates. First column is all new plates average. Second column is surfaces A and C touching. So here's your brand new. Here is your absolutely worn out. So we'll go down the model column until we find there's D2. Track that over. Brand new steering clutch pack thickness spec, two and seven eighths inches. And flat wore out, two and 19 30 seconds. So now we know what we're looking at. And I've just finished measuring both packs. Each one is right at three and one eighth inches thick. So yeah, we're we're a full quarter inch above that two and seven eighths average new spec. That's much more than manufacturing uh, variants. So both were at three and an eighth. Both have eight friction discs, eight steels. These are the original, what is referred to as organic discs, meaning there's friction material riveted to a steel core. Those, were prone to swelling if rust would build between all the plates. They were also prone to uh, swelling up fatter if there was a lot of moisture in those steering clutch compartments. And you remember 1113 did have one steering clutch that was mildly stuck when we brought it home. I'll pop you to that link. You can go back and relive all that when we towed it around with the, with the old RD6. But yeah, so we're, uh, we're a bit on the fat side with these. So not really sure why, 
but I can tell you I wouldn't want them to be much thicker because we're already just about coil bound on our steering clutch springs, meaning those coils are just about touching and you're just about out of any further compressibility to be able to release that clutch because if those coils are already stacked on one another, you can't compress them anymore and you can't disengage that clutch. So, all right, we have a starting point. Let's take them apart. And as usual, first step is to compress all of the springs. And once the keepers are free, we'll walk those out of there. Luckily, these packs are not very rusty. So this stuff all comes apart without a lot of trouble. Another tip for digging these out. It takes a pick a lot of times to get them pulled out of the pin but if you place a magnet on the pick it magnetizes the pick helps you to dig them out of there easier Now we release the tension. Again, watch for hang ups as the retainers come up past the keeper grooves and the ends of the pins. You taps usually make sure all that stuff stays dislodged. All right, tension's off. We're safe now. So we'll just start. Man, I can't believe those retainers look as nice as they do. We'll just start disassembling here. Everything is just rust free. Man, it all looks really good. I'm starting to think 1113 had some steering clutch system service shortly before it was parked because I tell you what these springs are looking awesome so we're just gonna look for flat spots on coils and of course brakes or excessive rust and so far thinking with a slight cleanup these are going to be probably well capable to be put back into service I don't know We'll do some tests on them too. We have tension specs for all those. So let's get the hub out of there. Just getting a, uh, a read on spline wear in here. Tell you what, it almost looks like new yet. And here's where we will alternate friction disc and steel disc friction steel so yeah we've had some rust in there it's it's pretty brown pretty dirty wear wise they look excellent rivet heads are still well countersunk so friction steels are the internal spline and yeah you can see there there's some rust in there that's uh that could have a cumulative effect on clutch pack thickness. But, yeah, boy, wear-wise, wear sorry, this stuff all looks excellent. I 
I think with some cleanup, these could all be put back into service if a person had to. Like I said, should be eight of each, 16 total. Just getting a read for what each one looks like here. All pretty much the same. We're getting down to the end of it. And we finish with a steel. Okay. So that's the that's the back. I can take this pressure plate off now. Now all the pins are still captured by the release bearing on the back side, so we will disassemble this further. But for now, I want to get the other clutch pack broken down to the same state as the first one. As long as we're at one more breakdown of my compressor tool, you see I have a nut and then this flat disc and then another nut on top of that. Both of those nuts are cinched down on either side of that disc. That not only retains the disc, but it keeps the center screw from spinning as I'm cranking pressure down up above on those springs. And another safety aspect of it, if I did not have this disc in here, if I just had even like a double nut set up on this rod and only had those in the jaws of the vise and then set the, uh, here, and then set that hub of that clutch pack directly on the jaws of the vise, the only thing holding that center screw up through that clutch pack when I crank all that pressure down would be the friction of that nut in the jaws of the vise. That's a dangerous situation because without this disc in there that captures this whole assembly in the forcing screw, you crank down pressure up above, that's like 15 to 1700 pounds of pressure to uh, compress all those springs. That could easily rip that nut right out of the jaws of the vise and it shoots up like a like a rocket after that. So yeah, capturing these with that disc and making sure nothing can just explode up through major safety aspect to keep in mind here. It takes a while to run this nut all the way down to get onto the compressor disc, but you definitely want to have enough threaded rod sticking up to be able to back that off and completely release tension on all of those springs before you run out of thread because you don't want to have the nut come off of there with an unknown amount of pressure still on and again pieces could fly you know stored energy you have to be thinking about uh, the danger aspect of it at all times even still you don't want to put your face or your head right above this because you know things can happen See, if we ran out of threads at this point right here, there's still tension on those springs. You know, definitely want to make sure you give yourself enough threads. There we go. All springs are free. So far, everything in the spring department is looking just like it did on the other side. Pressure plate off, or sorry, center hub off. Again, spline wear minimal. We're slightly less rusty on this side. We still had some in there. Of course, this had spent how many years sitting before we got it, so, you know, there's that unknown factor. Wear-wise, though, there's just no wear on any of these frictions. 
I'm sure 1113 had steering clutch work done to it at some point in time. There's no way this can be original. Just the, the sitting got to it. Pretty typical on D2s that sit for long periods of time, these steering clutch compartments build a lot of condensation and then everything suffers. Okay, now we're at the point we can work on getting these release bearings off of the pressure plate hubs. So first thing we need to do is remove this nut and you can see it's locked to the hub by these two Allen head set screws and each one of those is staked in. You can see that round peening mark there that displaces just a little bit of metal up over the top of that set screw. So you can usually loosen these and then work them out Get a good fit with the Allen wrench here. There we are. Yeah, these shouldn't come apart without, or these shouldn't come apart too badly because we're pretty rust free. Yep, see we've already displaced that staking mark, so this one will come right out of there. There we go. And the way they do that, once the nut was installed, they drill a hole down that basically is half in the hub and half in the nut and then they thread it and then they put that set screw in there so you do not want to mix up the nut and the hub don't put one on the other keep them as a match set because if you swap nuts around these threads will never line up again so work through that staking mark There we go, I think we're pretty much through it. Yep, two for two. Now to remove this nut, it's the slotted or notched type and these are just in pristine condition. There's <laughs> there's no like chisel and hammer marks. Nobody's ever you know improperly tried to, uh, to move them before and I wanna keep them that way. So I, I made a tool, all right, I know I do this a lot, but so what I did, I had an old beat up nut that somebody had hammered and chiseled on and it was just tore up. So I used that as, you know, the body of my tool. You can see the threads in there yet. And I put a three quarter inch square drive on the top because I had this old, oh, I think it's a Lyle brand Ford four wheel drive front hub socket from like, you know, mid nineties application. It was long ago obsoleted, didn't need it. So I cut the square drive top off of that and I welded it to the old nut and then I took uh, 3 8 square stock and just welded them into the slots that were in the old nut and they extend down as legs so that fits that perfectly boom I've got a socket for it no hammering no chisels we can keep everything in good condition There we are, everything's intact. At this point now, the manual states to use a puller if necessary to get this bearing and cage off, but I've been able to pry every one I've ever been into. Have not needed an actual puller, so let's just see. Yep, they usually come off, they're pretty easy. All right, there's our bearing this point now keep you all in frame right here let's check yep we can get all of these spring pins pulled out of the pressure plate okay so last thing we need to do here is get the bearing out of the cage so you need to peel this heavy retaining ring out, just like that. And there'll be a little bit of a uh, metal deflector ring under that. Now, we need to get the bearing out of the cage. So, show you something here. 
if you're lucky, you will have a cage that has these two holes in the back and that affords you access to go in with a punch and actually knock this thrust bearing out via the outer race. These are, these are thrust bearings. You can see we have, if I can find it, I think you can read it says thrust here and on the back side of the outer cage it'll also say thrust here. So they're only able to take thrust in that direction. The problem is we have the early cage that doesn't have the access holes so we we can press right here on this inner race but that is opposite of the direction of thrust that these are intended to cope with so we may just ruin the bearing. Like I said I've got new ones anyway so I'm not that worried about it but yeah we'll press this out. And like I thought, <laughs> we pressed the bearing apart. I figured that's what was going on as soon as that block kicked sideways, but okay, we'll weld it. All right, so that's gonna have to sit out there and cool down for a few minutes, <laughs> probably a good 20 minutes anyway. So we'll just keep moving on in here and you can see now why that comes apart so easily. So we'll remove the balls in the cage from that. You can see from the inner race, we have a, a rather good uh, a ramp down here, shoulder for those balls to run on, but then nothing going the other way. That's why it says thrust here. You know, it can thrust in that direction because they have a channel to write on there. But when we press it out opposite of that direction, the way we did, there's nothing holding it together and that's why the thing flies apart. The outer race is the same way. So we'll just, uh, like I said, let that cool off out there for a while. And well, we got enough time to ruin this bearing, right? Let's, uh, let's set it up in there and get to it. I think we're actually pressing this one out. It still fell apart. <laughs> oh, just not to get my hopes up momentarily. All right, so everything's cooled off. Here we have that that bearing out. We got this one here. Lead a bead all the way around, and yep, look at that. It's loose in there, so okay, that took it most of the way out. Let's see if we can work it out of there. There we are. Pulls right out by hand. Boy, that is a <laughs> that's a slick way to remove bearings. Too bad it ruins them. So okay. Steering clutches are completely apart, so be sure to keep that nut with that hub. I've got a lot of cleanup ahead of me. Um, I'll be busy here for at least a couple hours. Catch you later. Well, those couple hours turned into the next day. What can I say? Anyway, the results of my efforts are on the bench. Pardon the mess. Um, yeah, it's this is literally two days worth of cleaning and inspecting and checking every spring and lock and keeper and yoke and housing and pressure plate and nut and bolt and oil tube and banjo fitting everything we've got everything on here to put all the steering clutches all back together again and uh you know this is a pretty good illustration why crawler tractors have always been expensive even in you know 1938 back in 11 13's day Crawler tractors have always been more expensive than wheel tractors. They are to this day. And it's because there's so much going on in them. All this stuff here is maybe 75% of what it takes just to make a D2 steer. You know, I've had comments before below the videos where 
people have kind of been amazed that there's as much engineering going on in one of these little D2s as there is. And, you know, kind of made reference to, I always thought crawler tractors were just real basic and just not a lot there. And honestly, there's a lot of engineering in the tractor world in, you know, 11 13's day. The crawler tractor was the big tech of the era. So, yeah, that's why, you know, they're also always more expensive to fix because you have more components. You have more labor that goes along with it. And so we have some brand new steering clutch discs on the bench out here. We'll get into that in the next video. We also have some brand new release bearings to replace the ones that I unfortunately had to ruin to get apart. But here's all the original discs, frictions, and steels. These frictions can be used again. Clean the rust off of those and what little bit of oil there is, and those are good to go. These steels, I'm personally going to write off because uh, they're getting quite pitted, and you want them to have nice flat surfaces. You don't want them to have low spots. If you have low spots, the frictions are not going to contact the low spots during, you know, disengage and re-engage, and that's the first place that rust is going to start. Once rust has been on a surface, it's more apt to grow again, and then it balls up between the discs, and it gives you all kinds of problems. So most of this stuff, well, at least the steels are going away. Those frictions could be put back into service. So, and we, of course, have the old release bearings that I had to weld on. But, yeah, it's going to be, well, we'll just say some assembly required. But it's amazing how far this is going to condense down and just kind of fit into a couple pockets on that back end once we get it all put together. So, all right, everybody, this has been another episode in the Epic Caterpillar D25J1113 chassis rebuild series. So appreciate you all watching. Thanks for hanging out with me. I know some of the stuff gets a little bit long-winded, but there's a lot of details in it, and we have a fair amount of details to cover on the reassembly process as well. Anyway, as always, memberships are available below. We, uh, we had some fun with the making of this episode Clean some of this stuff. I had one comment already from the behind the scenes I put up last night that a guy's had rhinestone cowboy playing in his head for about three hours today, and he thanked me greatly for that. So we're out, we're starting to have some fun over there. It's some pretty good stuff. Plus, uh, brings with it early releases and ad free content on on all the new stuff. So if that's something that might work for you. Go down there, check it out. If not, hey man, I still appreciate you being here. Appreciate the subs, the likes, the clicks, and spreading the word about the channel. Please tune in again.